a rescue. There are 80,999 calls made every day. Hello, what's the problem? It's the police. Uh, can I have a police? I uh, just stole my money. Who stole your money? Some are more serious than others. You have not breathing. Okay, blow the little boy flat on his back for me there. I know you flat on his back. On rare occasions, the call is to report a death. I've run over my wife who's been feeding the cows and one of the cows must have known. Some people broke into her house. Okay, okay. Who stole all his money? Okay, Tim. But what if the caller... <laughs> she's not moving. Right, she's not moving at all. ...is in fact a killer. Someone being stabbed, I think they're dead. Plain Boys is uh, quite a sort of quiet um, suburb of London, really, uh, set very close to sort of Epping Forest. It's picturesque, it's affluent, and there are lots of fancy cars on the driveways. It's just a really lovely place to live. There is a tube station servicing it, so links into London are good. Oh, a sort of leafy suburb, really, I would describe it as. We do get a number of sort of house burglaries there, but um, no, not a huge amount of crime. For a murder to happen there, it's unthinkable, really. It would just completely rock the community. Darren Byrne was a stockbroker in London and had been for several years. So he's very much a money man. Darren went into stockbroking when it was a very good career. He was very popular among his colleagues. He had the gift of the gab. He'd worked his way up in the city and he was a very successful stockbroker. Always had time for his colleagues, would always stop and have a chat in the corridors. I'll get back to you tomorrow when I'm in the office, yeah? You take care. Just a really great guy to be around. Darren and Maria met in the city. She was backroom staff at a bank. They met through mutual friends and they just clicked. And they started dating. By all accounts, Darren and Maria were an excellent match. She was a pretty, petite brunette, a real family-focused woman. They were very happy. They married in 2008, uh, and then they had two children. Maria left work, stayed at home, raised the boys. She absolutely doted on her children and had devoted her life to them. She was a good wife. She would always put Darren before anyone else. Maria was described by families and friends as a really bubbly person, very, very family orientated, doted on Darren um, and the children would always look after them, maintained uh, a, a very, very nice, uh, clean house that was that always looked almost like a show home. Um, so she was very, very much a, a family-centred person. Their house sat in the street, a three-bedroom semi-detached, um, fitting in with all the other houses. The majority of the houses had expensive cars on the drive, um, all very well decorated, and ultimately it fit in perfectly. in the early parts of his years working as a stockbroker in London. Darren Byrne was very successful. He was, he was earning a good wage. Um, he obviously purchased a house in Thaden Boys and a very nice car, both children with private education. From the outside, Darren Byrne seemed to have it all. A successful career in the city. Nearly forgot. A doting wife. See you later. It's all right. It seemed like he had the perfect life. Bye. Around April 2015, Darren uh, suffered injuries uh, to his back as a result of a cycling accident.
and as a result of which he he um, received some osteopath treatment that he got from um, a practice in London. Darren Burns' treatment was performed by an osteopath by the name of Deborah. How did you do this? Oh, I came off my bike. There was a number of sessions that, that she, uh, where she was treating Darren. One deep breath, one two. Yeah, I had this silly idea about getting fit. <laughs> It didn't work out very well. Does that hurt? No, it's good. <laughs> You're a miracle worker. Honestly, you got to let me take you out for a coffee. As a thank you? Sure. You got my number? What's the date, then? Darren built a relationship with that osteopath up to the point that when his appointments were coming to a conclusion, he asked her out for a coffee. It would start with a cup of coffee somewhere, and then it would move into a drink at a pub or a bar. Actually, everyone on someone else's birthday. Do you? So if it is your... And so, yeah, what, what happens on a day? You get a kiss. I do. By the end of the second date, they'd kissed. <laughs> I think over those months, they, their relationship did escalate where it became quite serious emotionally between the two of them. Hello, Deborah speaking. They would communicate generally on the telephone. Hello. He could call directly into her consultancy room and she could in turn call him at his desk. I've got patience any moment. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you. You're just gonna have to use your imagination. And they would then make arrangements to meet each other in the city, um, sometimes going out in the evening, but okay. often meeting in the afternoon. All right. Bye-bye. They both were aware that they were married and that they had children, and a relationship developed as a result of that where they were meeting up on a regular basis for drinks, and then later that developed into a sexual relationship where they were meeting for short periods of time in hotels. What am I going to do with you? <laughs> Uh, when am I going to see you again? I'll call you on Monday. I'll be waiting. There was clearly a chemistry, whether it was doing something illicit, whatever the case. Darren Byrne was clearly entranced by Deborah. For whatever reason, Maria felt naturally suspicious of Darren, whether his behaviour had changed or he'd spent too many late evenings at work. She felt the need to check the emails on his phone. <laughs> Maria became aware that Darren was having an affair when she found an email from the osteopath. This <laughs> caused her world to fall apart on the spot. With a luxurious lifestyle and a devoted wife and mother to his children, See you later. You too, Darren Byrne appeared to have it all. But the start of an affair was about to turn his world upside down. Maria became aware that Darren was having an affair when she found an email from the osteopath. It obviously caused her world to fall apart on the spot. Maria. Maria, that isn't what it looks like. Maria, look at me, darling. Look at me, darling. 
That's not what it looks like. What is it then? What is it? It's nothing. I swear, it's just nothing. Really, it doesn't look like nothing. It's just some flirty emails, you know? How could you do this to me? Nothing happened. This is nothing. It, it, it's just a set of flirty emails. I mean, it doesn't mean a thing, baby. Just a bit of fun, you know? Fun? 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 Give me your phone. Now. Maria, you're jumping all over the place. It's, you're not... You're not thinking Give straight, me right? your phone. Give me your phone. Maria was so outraged, she called Darren's mistress. Are you listening to me, you tramp? If I ever, ever find out that you've messaged my husband again, I'm going to ruin you. I'm going to tell your, your husband, I'm going to tell your work. To, how, how dare you? She threatened to expose her and ruin her career. How dare you? Don't you ever, ever contact him ever again. <laughs> Maria's mother recalls <laughs> Maria being on the telephone and that it was quite a big thing for Maria to do because she was quite a shy individual. After Maria found out that, um, that Dan was in a relationship with another woman, uh, they'd spent several days and probably weeks trying to, to piece together their relationship and decide what they would, they would hold for the future for them. Please, please just stop. I don't know what to say to you, Darren. What do you want me to say? I can't trust you say anymore. Whatever you need. Whatever you want, Maria, yeah? Everyone deserves a chance, surely. Everyone. Maria was absolutely intent. Uh, on that relationship working for the sake of the two boys. Darren agreed as, as part of the uh, uh, reconciliation that he would not have any contact and he would sever his contact with um, his mistress. Darren assured her that nothing else was continuing. Part of that process was they'd agreed to go to America to celebrate Darren's 40th. Whether she believed Darren's version of events that it was just harmless flirting or whether she thought it was something more, we'll never know. A few months passed and the financial crash in the city was putting extreme pressure on Darren. It wasn't long before the cracks began to reappear in his marriage. They were having marital problems. However, the general stresses of a big large family Christmas had brought things to a head on Boxing Day. We finished it, I've had enough. Yeah? Why don't you just let it all go? You're not the victim in this. You I am the victim. Darren had told Maria he wasn't happy and he was thinking of leaving her. Why don't you just go, Darren? You are so pathetic. Why don't you just He was stressed leave? at work and the financial crash had put his job in jeopardy. She was aware that he was having stresses and strains at work, perhaps with the financial crisis, but for one reason or another, he was underperforming. Added to the couple's stress, Maria now insisted on monitoring Darren's every movement. If Maria was suspicious before the discovery of the emails, she was even more paranoid afterwards. She had a reason to be suspicious of his activities, and that continued and, if not, got worse. She would question where he was, who he was with, all the time. Look, she wants a picture. She wants a picture because she wants to know that I'm here with you. Cheese. When Darren went out for a drink with his friends, she'd ask for a picture of who he was meeting. I think trust had completely fallen out of that relationship, and I think quite rightly so on Maria's part. She'd been burnt, and the trust was gone. And added up problems, on the 5th of February 2016, Darren was made redundant from his job at RJ O'Brien. When Darren was made redundant and, and leading up to there, he, he was starting to struggle financially. Um, so the image of, of him and his home life and the expensive car was very quickly diminishing. Maria and Darren had borrowed money to try and continue their, their lifestyle. On the 12th of February 2016, Darren Byrne was in London. He was, he was looking for a job, seeking new employment. He travelled to London to meet with some contacts with a view to finding a new job. 
After the day spent job hunting, Darren Byrne returned to Thaden Boys. Putting their marital problems behind them, the couple went for an early Valentine's dinner, with their children staying with Maria's mother. You ready? Ooh, new outfit. Come on then, give us a twirl. Shut up. You look amazing. Really? Honestly. <laughs> they went to a local Italian restaurant in Thaden Boys. I viewed the CCTV from that location. It gives a very good view of exactly where they're sitting, looking over their table, and they are a perfectly happy couple enjoying a nice evening out together. Appeared a very loving couple. Um, Darren's demeanor was, as he'd always had been, very confident, um, interacting with the staff there. Just, it looked like a, a happy meal between a couple. I recall Maria's mother recounting that Maria had phoned her whilst Darren had popped to the toilet and been excited that they were making plans for the future. They were talking about perhaps moving house and just ultimately moving forward with their relationship. Maria was happy with the way things were and it was obvious from her body language. Following the perfect evening, the couple enjoyed some alone time at home. The Barnes' marriage appeared to be back on track. On the morning of the 13th of February, uh, Darren and Maria are alone in the house uh, as the children are staying at the in-laws. According to Darren, they had a very leisurely morning. Hey, where are you going? Come back to bed. I don't know what to do. Why don't you make me breakfast? Mm, bacon sandwich. Oh, yeah. Anything. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Okay. Darren Byrne later went out to walk the dog with the plan that when he returned, Maria would have made a bacon sandwich for him. Cool, we're going out. So Darren leaves the family home at 13.47. Uh, he takes the dog into, uh, in, around the block into a nearby area. When he returns to the family home, no sign of forced entry. Maria. But as he enters the house and goes into the kitchen, he can see Maria lying on the floor. The hob was still on, a frying pan was across the room, and Maria was on fire. At 15.31 hours, we received a 999 call that was routed through to the ambulance service. Having overcome their marital problems after the discovery of Darren's affair, 
the Byrne's marriage seemed back on track. Until Darren returned home from walking the dog to find Maria's lifeless body on fire. During the 999 call that Darren made to the ambulance service, he described the scene and he described how he'd walked in the front door and found his wife on fire. And he, for quite some time, is giving her CPR. You can hear him giving her chest compressions, saying he tells the operator that he has first aid knowledge and that this is just unfolding. He describes her physically being on fire when he walked in that room. He was quite clear that he he believed she was dead. Um, now can you tell me exactly what's happened? Um, my wife's dead. What? She's dead. There had been some sort of cooking accident. He described her tongue as sticking out from her mouth, so he was unable to give her breath. She's burnt badly. She's burned? Yes. How did she get burned? Uh, the, the stove was on and the frying pan's on the other side of the room. Okay, is she breathing? The tongue's out of her mouth. Can you see her chest rising and falling? Oh, she... Is she breathing? Uh, she's not breathing. And uh, she's hard. And he reports that, or describes it as like a cooking accident where his wife had set light to herself. Um, he described that the pan was on the other side of the kitchen and that she was basically smouldering. And he also reiterated his belief whilst crying that she was dead. Within about 10 minutes, the ambulance service were on scene and they quickly recognised that they, there was nothing they could do for Maria. She was deceased. Police arrived soon after that. The burning on her body was mainly on the clothing. It was the clothing that had burned as opposed to her. It was across her face and where the flesh had initially been exposed that the, there was the blackening and the, the burning of the hair being missing. Mr. Burnham. When police arrived and uniform officers attended and they spoke with Darren, he appeared very upset um, by what had happened and he kind of described the whole scene as a, 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 as a tragic cooking accident. I went out with the dog, took the dog for a walk. Well, uh, I got back, she, she... He was lying on the floor. That isn't true. There were a couple of neighbours who Darren and Maria were particularly close with and would socialise with, and they were helping Darren, comforting Darren. The next thing as well was to move Darren away from the scene to allow officers to uh, start, start the investigation, speaking to neighbours and ultimately the forensic exam. Later that day, Darren Byrne was taken to the local police station to be interviewed as a significant witness. When, when he was initially interviewed as a witness, Darren gave us a full account of, uh, in terms of his movements that day, in terms of Maria, the fact that they'd been out for dinner the night before, and the fact that she was gonna cook him a bacon sandwich, and that he left the property to walk the dog, and when he returned, he found found her as she was on fire uh, and assumed that the, the, uh, the pan had caught light. We had such a lovely evening together. We ate our little Italian. She turned heads when she walked in the door. <sighs> so Darren, talk me through what happened the following morning. Just usual stuff, you know, we just, we caught up, we, we mucked around. Made a cup of tea. So I take the dog out. Walk him around. When I get back, she's lying there on the floor. For all intents and purposes, it appeared Maria had died in a freak cooking accident. 
Having been interviewed by police, Darren relocated to Maria's mother's house to be with his children. When this case initially um, opened and our team became involved with it, I think mixed emotions were the order of the day, really. When Maria's body was discovered by Darren, and Darren had then described how he'd found that body, Maria. it was an unexplained death. What he was describing needed to be proven, needed to be shown that that was the case before it could be taken forwards. To dug out for what? The officers that attended, but they just didn't understand the makeup of the scene. Given that he was described as a cooking accident, didn't necessarily ring true to them. From our local inquiries, we spoke to neighbours and friends of, of Maria and Darren. Um, we tried to build up the picture uh, between them. There was not uh, there was not anyone nearby that had seen anything particularly suspicious. We then led in really to, to a forensic side of the investigation uh, and took various samples from the scene and we, we cordoned off the house, took photographs, took Maria's clothing and we, we sent that up to, to the lab for being tested. Maria's body was recovered from the property and taken for post-mortem process. Uh, Dr Nathaniel Carey carried out the post-mortem um, on her body. The cause of death was essentially death by fire. The severity of the blaze and the inhalation of gases had killed Maria. Post-mortem showed that Maria had suffered burns uh, 30 to 40 per cent uh, on her body around, but particularly focused around her head and chest area. I recall when I first looked at the post-mortem injuries for the first time, I wasn't sure if Maria had ever had hair. She, she appeared, she was completely bald, and you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to distinguish her. It had just been burnt away and her skin was black to the point where you couldn't tell if she was a man or a woman. Dr Carey noted a number of injuries to her head and her wrists. She had injuries consistent with an assault. There were bruises to her head, uh, bruises to her wrists, and a couple of bruises to her body as well. As a result of the post-mortem, what that also showed is that she did suffer blunt force trauma to uh, locations around her head, on particular on each side of her head. But most notably and most shocking, the Home Office pathologist believed Maria was alive at the point she was set on fire. Maria Burns clothing was then sent for chemical analysis with the results returning within 24 hours. It quickly came back with a result that she had white spirit on her clothing. White spirit being a highly flammable accelerant. We also found half a bottle of white spirit in the garage and there's an adjoining door to the property. The post-mortem result and the chemical forensic testing had ruled out an accidental death. Maria Byrne had been violently beaten and burnt to death. Once we'd learned of the results of the post-mortem, this changed the investigation from an unexplained death to that there was a third party involved, somebody had caused these injuries and ultimately caused her death. As part of the ongoing investigation, police gathered all the CCTV footage from the vicinity. What that showed was there was no other party that we believe went to the address. The key part of the CCTV, however, showed that Darren Byrne gave his account to say that he walked the dog around the block once. And we were able to see that at 13.47, Darren appeared on CCTV for the first time that day. He walked uh, around the block with the dog and he returned back to that house about half an hour later. And he remained in that house for about five minutes. CCTV inquiries showed that in fact he walked around the block past the address on three occasions. CCTV ultimately proved what Darren had told us in his significant witness statement was lies ultimately. How long were you out walking the dog? <sighs> I don't know. Half hour, 40 minutes. 
Darren Byrne's account of a 40-minute dog walk was clearly not what police were seeing on CCTV evidence. At 1.47pm, he walks around the block and returns to the house half an hour later, where he waits for five minutes. He goes into the house and out again for another circuit. He eventually goes back into the house, where he calls 999. At this point, my belief is that Darren had gone out to walk the dog, hoping that he was going to see his house on fire when he returned. He didn't, he went back in, he went out again, until eventually he came back and in that 15 minute period staged a cooking accident. in terms of the wise spirit from what we'd found and the discrepancies in Darren's account around the CCTV, that coupled with the fact that there was no forced entry to the property allowed me to elevate Darren into what I'd describe as suspect status. On the 16th of February, police arrived at Maria's mother's house where Darren was now staying with the children and he was arrested on suspicion of murdering his wife. Armed with new evidence, Darren Byrne was now questioned as a prime suspect. During the interviews with Darren, he refused to answer any questions, answer no comment to all those questions. I've told you, no comment. And although he's entitled to in law, I, I found that strange, considering the fact that he'd given us a very full and detailed account uh, in terms of his movement and what took place leading to the death of Maria. No comment, yeah? With Darren Byrne formally charged with his wife's murder, detectives had to prepare for trial and build a watertight case against him. The investigation really started once we charged Darren. There was a lot of case to build around the passive data, the CCTV evidence and his movements. During the months leading up to the trial, we'd looked at Darren's background in terms of what his internet searching and, and who he'd been in contact with. Um, this, this identified that he'd been in contact with uh, a friend of his who gave him some, some advice around divorce. He'd done some research online and he was really trying to look at what the implications would be if he were to separate from Maria. As police dug deeper into the Burns' background, they discovered that Darren Byrne wasn't in fact the wealthy stockbroker they thought he was. Darren Byrne was living a life beyond his means. He had even borrowed money to stay out of debt. The clothes, the car, the private education for the children. Darren Byrne was running out of money. A panicked 999 call brought police to the scene of a reported cooking accident. But Maria Byrne's death was looking increasingly suspicious after traces of white spirit were found on her clothing and CCTV evidence contradicted her husband's alibi. Darren Byrne was arrested for his wife's murder. In preparation for the trial, police continued to investigate Darren Byrne's activities prior to the murder. They revealed a shocking discovery. Hey, it's me. Look, can I see you tonight? No. No, please, tonight. That affair continued to flourish and develop. Good. Good girl, right? Great. Yeah, I'll see you then. It was a sexual affair. There were liaisons in hotels. Darren's assurances that he would break off all contact with Deborah was an empty promise. The affair picked up where it left off. Once we had located and spoken to the lady that Darren had been having an affair with, she was obviously devastated. No. 
No, it can't, that can't be him. And very helpful to the investigation and was able to provide us with details of the phone that she would contact Darren on. We were able to obtain recorded telephone calls from Darren's company who for compliance reasons recorded them uh, for a three month period from around mid-November um, up until his redundancy. I was able to listen to the calls and it was quite apparent from the way that they would talk to each other that it was an ongoing affair. Deborah also revealed to police that after Maria had discovered the affair the first time, no, we never spoke about Darren her. had bought a second secret phone he used to contact her on. As it always has been. We had a specialist search team that completely searched the home address. What we found in there was Darren Burns's a second phone, the phone that he used to have contact with his mistress. We identified that there were several calls between uh, Darren and his mistress, almost daily and sometimes on more than one occasion during the day. Police now knew Darren had lied to Maria about the affair. And as the trial approached, Darren once again surprised the police. In the weeks leading up to trial, the indication was that Darren was going to change his story ultimately for the first time. At trial, Darren Byrne admitted for the first time that he and Maria had had a physical altercation. But that argument had resulted in Maria reacting physically towards him and he was forced to protect himself. and that resulted in her being struck by him and falling to the floor. He was quite plain that he had accidentally caused her an injury that had knocked her unconscious. Oh, Marie, get up. Get up. Okay, he believed she was play acting and making it more serious than it was, at which point he grabbed the dog stormed out the door. Darren Byrne claimed that when he returned home to find Maria dead, he panicked. Maria. Maria. He doused her body with white spirit, then set her body alight to fake a cooking accident. Prosecution, however, presented a very different version of events. Police had discovered the day before the murder, when Darren visited London for job hunting, he had in fact met with his mistress. They parted company and agreed to speak the next day on a Saturday. This was unusual, as normal rules of the affair dictated there would be no contact at the weekends. When Darren was made redundant, that was the first time that the burner phone was forced out of the office drawer and back to his home address. We believe that Maria had found the phone that Darren was using to call his mistress. What is this? What is this, Darren? It's there not are. Time, Maria. Really? It's another phone. No, no, no. Why have you been lying to me? You've been lying to me this whole time. Oh my God, I'm such an idiot. She must have realized at this point that everything her husband had told her was a lie. It was an affair. It's a work phone. It's a work phone? Well, I've seen the message. It's not for work. Romantic evening the night before, it was all a sham. Well, I've seen the message. Stop making out like I'm an calm, idiot. Calm down. I'm not going to calm down. Calm down, baby, please. Oh, my God, you're such a liar. I'm taking the kids and I'm gone. I want you out of this house. Marina, no, no, no. No, I'm, I'm getting a divorce. No, you're not getting Yes, I am. Maria. I'm getting a divorce. No, you're not I getting am. a divorce, Get Maria. Me. No, get out of the house. Ah. You're here. You leave me me. I'm giving you everything. Everything. Maria was assaulted on more than one occasion um, and she had some serious injuries to her head that were not consistent with the account that Darren had, had provided to police. He effectively realises at this point, best case scenario is she's going to come round and wake up and he will now be la labelled a wife beater. At this point he panics. He carried Maria's unconscious body on top of the children's table and tried to create a bonfire using the children's chairs. He pours white spirit over her body. After Dan's set Maria light, he's tried to cover his tracks. 
we believe he's then turned the gas on in, in the property with the intention of causing quite a large explosion to cover any evidence of, uh, of the assault that took place and then what he did afterwards. Um, as, we, as we know, he then walks around the block on three occasions with the dog, hoping the explosion will take place. He's highly expecting to see smoke pouring up from where he lives. He makes a further attempt, he goes out again, comes back, it's not working. He has another attempt where he then leaves again and then returns, at which point he is forced to make it look like a cooking accident. So he takes her off of the table and chairs, which are now black, and lay her on the floor, turns on one of the gas rings, lets gas circulate throughout the property, moves a frying pan to the other side of the room, and once all this is done, once he's created the, what he wants to sell as his story, he phones 999 and describes what he sees. Oh, my wife's dead. She's dead. She's dead. She's burnt badly. She's burnt? Yes. How did she get burnt? Uh, the, the stove was on and the frying pan's on the other side of the room. Okay, is she breathing? Her tongue's out of her mouth. Can you see her test wires have been falling? Oh, she's... Is she breathing? Yeah, she's not breathing. And it, it was a good act about um, how he felt, what he'd found, uh, and came across initially as, you know, this is a tragic cooking accident where his, his wife has suffered injuries that's led to a death. I'll never forget the time the jury came back. So they had the option of murder, manslaughter or acquittal. I can really clearly remember the time in which the, the, the foreman came back. The courtroom was very busy and it was a very intense atmosphere. And, and there was almost a sigh of relief from, from Maria's family at the point in which they came back with a guilty verdict. Maria's family were devastated and now they knew for sure that he'd killed their daughter.